All right, well, welcome to our very first Zoom interview with Naval Services Family Line. I'm Judy Huffman, and I'm here with my friend, Michelle Norman, who is, uh, aside from being just an awesome friend, has really become <laughs> an amazing advocate for military children and military families as they navigate the special education spectrum. Uh, real quick, our mission at Naval Services Family Line is to empower educate, mentor, and provide resources for our sea service families. And Michelle, you just absolutely embody that. So I'm really excited that we're here today and kind of Thank chatting you. both as friends and also um, kind of as Navy spouse mentors. We've both been around the block once or twice. <laughs> oh, I guess we're a little bit seasoned, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm a little salty as well, That's but uh, <laughs> we'll, try to, we'll try to eliminate that. Uh, <laughs> that side of it today. We'll stay real positive. Um, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, but that being said, um, you really, really have made a huge impact in this community um, with your work. And so I really want to introduce you to our Naval Services Family Line viewers today and allow you an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, kind of how you got started on this journey and then where it's taken you uh, in the last few years. So I'm going to turn it over to you <laughs> <laughs> and let you kind of just share initially yeah. your family story and how you got started in this. I will. Thank you so much, Judy. And thank you to Naval Services Family Line for providing this forum so that we can share what we've been doing as far as advocating for our kids with special needs and for education. Um, this has been really a treat. And of course, anytime I can share with our Navy family, I'm a happy camper. So um, that being said, yes, I'm a Navy spouse for over two decades. Um, I'll give a little background about me and my husband, Cass. We met at the University of Texas in Austin. We're both engineers. And um, he's always had a love to fly. And so when we were finishing up college, he's like, you know, I'm going to check out the Navy. And he was blessed to go to AOCS and um, fulfill that dream. That kind of began his Navy journey. And I joined a couple of years later. Um, it's been quite the ride. We've lived all over um, Japan, East Coast, West Coast. Um, he just finished his geo batch assignment in Italy, so we got to visit Italy. Um, it's been quite the journey. And during that time, as a Navy spouse, I was very fortunate to get some jobs um, in the private sector. And then when we moved into the Japan area, I was um, able to get a job as a civilian U.S. Navy engineer. So. I was able to do that in Japan and Pax River, Maryland and Point Magoo. Um, and we were still fairly young, but I think at that point we were just ready to start a family. Um, it took us a few years, but we were fortunate to um, have our daughter in 2003. And uh, that was when we moved back to Virginia. And um, that started a whole new journey and a whole new life for us. Um, she's my inspiration of what we've been doing for the past six years. She is 16 years old, Marissa, and um, she came into the world very early, you know, um, 27 weeks. She was two pounds, three ounces, a little firecracker, <laughs> um, and then she's a fighter. She spent a lot of time in the hospital, let's say it's about eight months. And a lot of, you know, they always talk about the NICU as being a roller coaster, and indeed it was a lot happened within those eight months. Um, with the, within the first week of life, she had a brain bleed on the left side of her brain, which affected her movement. She has cerebral palsy because of that, and she's got numerous diagnoses. But, you know, the, despite the doom and gloom from doctors, we knew that, you know, our lives have changed. We are now her best advocate. And it really did start at that moment of not just being a mom, but now being a person who's going to be speaking for her to make sure that she really surpasses all of these, you know, expectations really that the doctor kept throwing at us. So she may never walk, she may never talk, she may never eat on her own. Um, and so that started my new life. So engineering down the tube um, and now full on advocate mom. <laughs> and it really was medical for the first few years. Um, it really was trying to catch up on a lot of milestones. You know, she had a trach when she was first born. So that was a very big life or death situation. Um, to get reconstructive airway surgery to make sure she could breathe. And then once we got that settled, um, when we concentrated on her walking and talking, all those other things that kids, you know, do easily um, and are taken for granted. So, of course, during this whole time, Cass is busy. 
<laughs> you know, around. he's doing his thing. Uh, when she was born, he was with CAG staff and they were getting ready for deployment. So they're in the middle of workups. And mm. fortunately, he was able to take, you know, emergency leave. You know, I always say the Navy's been really good to us. Um, and, you know, pretty early on, we were in the EFMP program like, almost immediately. And it was kind of a blur. I just remember a lot of paperwork coming home, like we need to fill this out, we need to fill this out, have the doctor, you know, sign this. She was still in the hospital. So a lot of the EFMP just was like, I, I don't even really remember some of it actually. <laughs> but, um, you know, and that kind of has been our life. You know, he's, he's here for important things, gone, you know, so it really is up to the caregiver, the, the mom, to kind of make sure that things are in place. Um, once we got through a lot of the medical hurdles and she started, school early through the early intervention program um we were just thrilled you know that she could be with her peers and so the great thing is with regardless of all these diagnoses she still had cognitive average cognitive abilities and so we knew that she could learn just she maybe needs to learn in a different way right and so she was doing fantastic you know when she entered school we moved to rhode island we came back to virginia moved to the pentagon moved back you know, things were great. We always loved hearing all that positive news. Oh, she's doing wonderful. She's walking. Da, da, da. So it wasn't until she got a little older um, that I started to see more things, as this happens a lot with EFMP families. And um, we had a really rough go when we moved back to Virginia in 2014. She had a really good setup in Fairfax County. She has an IEP, which most um, kids in special education will have. It's an individualized education program. And she had a lot of supports and services and goals in there. Um, but when we moved to Virginia Beach, um, things have changed since the last time we lived here. We had great, great services last time. Um, and I just, you know, you have that gut feeling like the IEP wasn't being followed. You know, a lot of questions about when we're moving again. We had this feeling that perhaps, you know, they were only willing to give what the resources were they already had versus what she needed. And um, that kind of started the advocacy for us. You know, it's been a long road, but from there we, um, we fought for her education, you know? And then as this journey has gone through, which we'll go through, we realized we weren't alone. You know, that this is actually happening a lot to our military families is that you're only in places for two to three years. And, you know, we can't afford any gaps in the education for our very vulnerable kids. And that's really what's happening in the fight to, to put up is very difficult for these families who are already stressed and overburdened. They don't have a lot of resources. And, um, and you know, the same for me. When I first started this advocacy route, I did call and I tried to figure out who, who can help me. You know, could the local JAG help me? I know what the, the law is now. I never really had to know before I had problems. But now that I'm having a problem, I'm, I'm sifting through information through websites, through Facebook, and I'm like, this is not right. Um, you know, school liaison officers couldn't help. It's not really in their position description. They get their families, um, case managers couldn't help me. And so I felt like we were really alone. And unless another special education family is going through the same thing, um, you really are alone. And so we wanted to make sure we could change that for the future. So um, long story short, we, legally we battled um, we've been successful and we've been sued by the school district and successful, but the great thing is my daughter, you know, is finally getting the education that she, um, is afforded through federal law. And we want to make sure we can help other families. Um, they're in the same situation as us, which, you know, there are many, you know, once the media started to catch on about what the Normans were doing, I was flooded with so many emails and messages and texts saying, you're telling my story, this has happened to us, but we were too tired, too scared of reprisal, not from just the school district that have multiple kids, but also from their commands. And we thought, goodness, we need to band together. We need to have a collective voice. And that's really what the start was um, with our advocating on, in Congress and our advocating you know, within the Navy and DOD and then the local level and the state level, it just, how to affect change so that our families can serve our country without having those educational hurdles for their kids. No, I That's kind of the start of everything. <laughs> I, I am so, I really wanted you to share that because I feel like that's a lot of what, um, as military families and Navy families, we experience, we feel very um, at a loss for what's available, what's right, what do we, 
um, have as far as resources? Where do we go for resources? Because until you face that, you really just don't know. And so um, I think that's really important what we're trying to do at Naval Services Family Line is to help families know where to go when they have uh, an issue, whether it's with PCS moving or you know, healthcare, medical care, those type of things. So I'm really excited um, that you have not only just fought your battles, but now you're making changes for other people. And I've got to see you in action a little bit. Um, I'm up here in the DC area and before this COVID stuff, when we could actually meet in person, I got to see you testify um, at a congressional hearing. So, I mean, right? <laughs> it's crazy. I never would have guessed that in this short period of time that we would have elevated this, this issue to the point of, of speaking, you know, and testifying, which is not exactly the easiest thing to do. That, it was a crazy time of my life because um, I was just in a conference like the day before giving um, a session on advocating and then flying back and getting on an early train from Virginia to DC with my family. So um, what a blessing that was though, to be able to be, to speak on behalf of all of our, you know, EFMP families. And um, I was fortunate enough to meet the other military spouse, Austin, who was speaking, and we did kind of coordinate a little bit prior to that because I, my wheelhouse, my subject matter expertise is really on the special education side. Of course, I've had a lot of issues on the medical side, but um, really it was the education. And so we kind of said, if you can focus more on the medical, I'll focus more on the education. And um, a lot of work goes into testifying. You have to write a written statement. Um, that took about a week. We didn't have a lot of time. So you want to make sure that this is really what the staffers are going to read before this, this briefing, this mass hearing. Um, so you want to make sure you have everything you ever wanted. And then I included family stories. We did a call for family stories. So I think we got about 50 to 100 of them as an appendices so that they could read when they had time. Um, that it wasn't just, you know, two spouses speaking about it. This really is a community. And, you know, it had been over a decade. Um, since Congress had asked about EFMP. Wow. And there were some things in place that had to, was supposed to happen within that decade and it happened. So I think they were kind of like at that breaking point of like, when are we going to make change on this? Um, and I had started working with our congressional leaders and we had issues the first time before, um, right after our first due process that we won in two, six, 2016, I started contacting the congressional leaders like, hey, they're not following the law here. Or they're not following the hearing officer's decision. And so we started building relationships. Um, and then PBS got a hold of our story. Stars and Stripes got a hold of our story. And then I was fortunate to win the title of the AFI Military Spouse of the Year for Navy. And so I think that's getting that out there is when all the other families were like, oh my goodness, someone's actually talking about my experience. Um, and then I found that it was super easy once you get, once you get that comfort zone of just reaching out to your leaders, your legislators, you know, actually making those connections, walking the halls of Capitol Hill and having a very, you have to have a story, a compelling story, but also a solution. You know, you don't want to approach problems without a solution. And I think if you can do the work for them and say, this is what's happened to me, this happened to X amount of people in your state, that your constituents, but here's how we can solve it. Um, that was really, um, it really helped us in our advocacy because we were just not complainers. We were actually someone who can, you know, make a difference. And this is how you can make that difference. Um, so we really started last year working with people. We were fortunate to meet up with um, the military, the Congressional Military Families Caucus, which is co-chaired by Congresswoman McMorris Rogers and Congressman Bishop Sanford, Sanford Bishop. And um, they have a yearly summit and they talk about family readiness issues. And then I was able to talk to them about special education and, and convince them that we needed a panel <laughs> to talk about this. And I'm gonna find three other spouses to talk about this with me. And sure enough, we were granted this panel and I think that really opened the door to talk about our stories um, because I think it's a very difficult subject when you're talking about federal law. The assumption is that everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing and that's what law is there for. Um, and this was kind of the first time they've heard about the challenges that our families were experiencing and what the culture had been for a lot of 
public schools, not all of them, but you know, most of them know that you're gonna be moving. So perhaps they don't have to um, do as much as in the IEP as, as they want knowing that. And that kind of also got, you know, that such positive feedback. Um, Congressional, uh, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers said, you know, draft some legislation for us. And that's where we came up with the Promise Act. I mean, wow. engineers, <laughs> actually, we have an attorney, co-founder, Grace Kim. We've got another Navy spouse, Shannon Block, and an Army spouse, Casey McCarley. And we all worked really hard together um, to draft about the Promise Act, which is protecting the rights of military children in special education. We needed to be a little bit, you know, um, snazzy of an acronym. So it worked out really great. And there's 12 initiatives in it that kind of look at all the problems and hurdles that we typically face when we PCS. And so how do we put some protections and safeguards in there? How do we make sure there's more resources out there for our families, um, such as special education attorneys? And lastly, let's take a look at the impact aid that's coming to these school districts um, and make sure that they're going towards those students that they're um, aligned for. Um, and I think we're, we were lucky. We were able to, um, you know, work with these legislators. We saw Bill 6489 come through on the House side that really incorporated most of our initiatives that we spoke about. And um, it's in both of the NDAA drafts on the House side and the Senate side. They are a little bit different on both sides. The House side has the special education attorneys and EFMP standardization, whereas the Senate side um, has GAO studies, um, one of them in particular about the impact aid, which the House didn't have. So we'll see what happens when conference happens, but we got fingers crossed that EFMP standardization is gonna go well. And um, this is gonna be a real support and lots of resources for our families so that when they do run into these problems education, they know that they can get something like an, an advocate or an attorney um, and the Navy's leading the way. So I'm super proud about that. And um, being involved with that has just, I don't know, it makes my heart happy to know that they, they really have taken the ball and run with it after they heard about our story and um, they want to make things right and really support our, our Navy sailors. And I'm just so thrilled about it. Well, a couple of things that you said that really stood out to me. Um, number one was that you weren't there just to complain. You were there to problem solve. And so you came up with some solutions. You said, this is our need. This is what we think will help solve it. So let's bring that together. And I do think um, having spent a little time in the DC area working in uh, that arena, that's huge for our uh, both for Congress and for our Navy leaders because they've got a lot on their plates too. Yes. And they're not the experts on, you know, the special education needs of our military children. We, as the parents, really do become the, the experts. And so for you to be able to share with them, this is our problem and this is what we think is the solution, I think that really empowered them to be able to say, yeah, let's, let's do this. It is, it can become very emotional. And there's nothing wrong with being emotional because that really has that compelling story. But to be able to then say, okay, poof, all right, but here's the solution. <laughs> you got to have some black and white. And it's, it's hard, you know. Um, I think that, you know, the housing dilemmas that have been going on for several years started out, you know, very compelling. But now they're starting to get to the, the good problem-solving piece of it, like the Tenant Bill of Rights. And so there's, there's some good movement on that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that that is one of the things that we see is that we need the emotions and the passion to keep us going yes. as Navy spouses. We need to believe in what we're fighting for, whether or not it's just that we support our country and we support our spouses. So 180 days into deployment, we're still feeding our kids. Right. Um, <laughs> and then we also need to take that step back when we're really trying to enact change to say, you know, this is the analytical side. This is how we analyze what we're doing and, and what will be the solution to the problem. It's not just that passion. Exactly. Uh, so I just think that you and Grace and some of those other folks that are, you're working with are just that perfect combination. And then, um, you know, there is always timing, right? Like what's going on in the world. And so it, it really is a lot of timing. And once you have that momentum, you don't want to let go of it. And so once we had the testimony, we had a congressional briefing that you came to shortly after that, where we were able to get some key legislators and staffers there. Um, and then just connecting with the right people. And then it's just, COVID did a little bit of, um, you know, bumped us a little bit, but 
in actuality, it kind of worked for us because we still had those relationships already developed. So calling, emailing, writing thank you cards, um, those personal touches mean a lot. And then also we had so many webinars. A lot of our families were struggling, you know, when schools just all of a sudden stopped. Many of them did not receive their IEP services or supports wow. anymore, just like a lot of, you know, military families. It wasn't just those with special education, it was across the board, but I think that the risks are so much, mistakes are so much higher for our kids and to get them back on track is really gonna be difficult. And when you have a lack of, you know, guidance, you know, from whatever level of government it might be, it just makes them feel like they're in some limbo. Um, so it's gonna be very interesting this next fall on how things are happening. But like I said, I, I think that the, the service branches are now and gonna be better positioned, I think, to help these families out. Um, so for the Navy, right. they yeah. started um, an EFMP reform committee um, about eight months ago. And I've been very fortunate to be a part of it. And um, they have really looked at the whole scope of the problem and how to address it in various areas. Um, one of the things that they, that um, Admiral Chip Rock um, put together was a pilot program that is going to be for the San Diego area and Hampton Roads area. And this program is um, already in the works. I think they've already hired, they're hiring special education attorney on each coast. Um, they are also hiring an advocate to go with that special education attorneys on both coasts. And then they're adding four additional case managers for EFMP to kind of lighten the load among EFMP staff. And what this, and they chose these two locations because they are EFMP centric. A lot of our sailors and their families who are in EFMP go to these two locations. There's actually five total that are really heavy. Um, you know, you've got the Washington, Bremerton area, DC area, and Jacksonville, Florida, but it, it appears that many go to San Diego and to the Hampton Roads. And this is gonna be super helpful as far as being a resource for these families. If they have any problems, they can at least reach out to the EFMP program and say, I'm having these issues. I need someone to come to an IEP meeting with me. I'm pretty sure I know the law, but I'm being told X, Y, Z. I feel like I need someone else there with me. And that means so much to these families. If they can have someone who's well-versed in the law um, to just make sure you're, it's like a sanity check, you know, and making sure that you, you have, you can hear both sides and, and come up with a, a compromise. Really, we always call for partnering with our schools as much as possible. None of us want to fight. We just want what our child, and it's not even a high quality. We just want the bare minimum of what FAPE is, free appropriate public education. We're not asking for like the best of everything. We just want what the law is, you know, mandated to give. Um, so I think that's going to be super helpful with all of the things that are going on with going back to school, just to know that these two, two locations, they can have advocates that can go to these meetings with them. Um, and if it's something that the advocate cannot um, facilitate, then it can be going to the next level, which would be the attorney. So, and then the other flip side of that is that once you do have attorneys in these areas representing Navy families, I think that maybe it keeps everybody in check a little bit more. Just to know that there is someone that you can go that's fighting on your behalf if you need it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, everything will be run a little bit more smoother. So that's our, our hope. So that's one of the things we're doing. They also recently hosted an amazing special education boot camp through William and Mary College, um, where they invited over 130 military attorneys, paralegals, EFMP staffers, not just Navy, but they um, opened the doors for all the services to come. It was a virtual special education boot camp. And so now all the JAGs should have some, at each location, should have some idea of what special education is all about. Because before, right. I think, if you just don't have that training, it is very specialized. Sometimes they call it boutique. Um, but at least now, if a family does go, and because that's one of the first places you might want to call is the legal office. Like, this doesn't sound right. At least right. I can say, you know what, you're right. I, I went to a course. I know exactly what you're talking about. This is what we need to do, you know, and here, here's the advocate that needs to go with you, or maybe I can write a letter, you know, whatever it might be. But sometimes that's enough to kind of get things going in the right direction. So that was such a, a, a wonderful opportunity that the Navy put together and like, woo, awesome. Two other things, they had the EFMP survey that came out recently. I think the deadline was um, 
June the 15th. And so I'm looking forward to seeing those results and yeah. how that might drive some more change and reform. And they also are coming out with the EFMP app. I don't know if it's going to be within um, another app, but it is going to be helpful for a lot of families. And it's very easy to read and it has all the information you ever need to know about enrolling, disenrolling, what kind of resources are available, newsletters, news feeds. It's amazing. So um, I think I, it's great. So I didn't know about the app. So I'm really excited for that because I yeah. do think that, um, you know, it, it's overwhelming. Like you said, when you first started, you're like, I don't even know, like there's how many papers, what did I sign? Right. So <laughs> to be able to have it one place, um, I think is really, really big. And I love the fact, I know at your testimony at Congress, one of the big things was not having any representation at those IEP meetings or having anybody to be able to say, no, I don't think that's right. Or this is what you need to do. And so as a family member, when you are, you know, worried about your child and your service member may be, be deployed, you're just knowing that somebody is able to listen and to maybe give you a little bit of advice is a huge piece. It's huge. It is because, you know, I think as military families, we're always, um, we're used to the law and good order and not really questioning authorities. And so it's a very uncomfortable position to be in when you have, let's say 15 people around a table and it's just you and you right. want to be, um, you know, amicable and, and, and want to hear great things perhaps of what's going on with your child or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it puts you in an awkward position. You know, and um, that's why I always tell people tip number one is to always record the meetings because that way, if your spouse is deployed, you can still, you know, put it on a cloud and say, hey, here's what happened. I know you can come in today, you know, because you're out and about doing great things for our country, but, you know, here's the recording. And then you can actually be present, you know, in that meeting and not worry about writing notes, you know, all of a sudden, you know that it's there. So now you can look people in the eye, really think about what's important to you and not worry about writing notes. So always, always, always record. Now give them a heads up. Some states need 48 hours to know, but in Virginia, you can literally go into a meeting and go, I'm going to be recording on my iPhone. Beep. And you know, it's just a great part of the law that it protects you, it protects them. It's a good thing. So, um, but yes, you do need, you know, one time I took in my daughter's godmother with me, you know, she's also an engineer. She works um, locally and she's like, that was the most stressful meeting I've ever gone to in my entire life. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, try about 15 or 16 of those in a year. Let me know what you think. <laughs> so it is going to be great to have that support. Oh, that's so, awesome. Great. Well, and so that actually, you talked about just that ability to record. I mean, some people may not know that. And so you guys, um, you and your friends have created a website that's got a lot of resources. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Um, yeah, let's do. So once we um, started doing some of this advocating last year, me and those three spouses had, that presented in Fort Benning at that caucus summit, we decided to found um, Partners in Promise, which of course the Promise again is protecting the rights of military children in special education. And we thought we need to have something that shows what is our mission? You know, how do we advocate? How do we work with MSOs and you know, the federal level, the state level? How do we affect change? We need to really get together and bring in other families because I think, again, there really wasn't um, an organization that was niched as us as far as for special ed. So we came up with Partners in Promise. And um, so we're very, very young, but it's been an amazing ride so far. So let me go ahead and um, yeah, share my screen with, so it's at www.thepromiseact.org the is where we're located. Um, and we have a lot of fantastic resources. This is kind of the main page where mm -hmm. we always have something in the very top of what needs, what actions we're asking our members to do. Right now, because with the drafts of both the Senate and the House are up for a con conference, we're just asking people to thank their representatives who have um, supported um, our EFMP standardization and other initiatives. So that's kind of like the bullet point. But we have information on who we are, how to get involved, you know, just some of the basics of here's how you find your legislator and let them know about your family story and what they can do to help. And then we also have our stories. Um, when we had our military special education survey last fall, we wanted to make sure we got a little bit of data, but mainly the stories of other families. And so we shared them on that part of it. 
Um, this is the PBS NewsHour video that was um, filmed on our family in early part of 2019. And it really talks about the first part of our, <laughs> of our legal battle. She references the fact that we're going to another um, hearing, but she didn't mention that we were actually sued by the school district. Um, so it's a really great, PBS NewsHour really elevated our, our um, dilemma to, to the world. Um, this talks a little bit about the military education survey, and we have some photos of families. So let me go through the top, and um, the who we are is really just a basic, where it talks about, you know, how we started by educating and advising the legislative agendas of, you know, MSOs, Department of Defense, public officials, Congress, um, and why we came up. And it just talks about me, Grace, Shannon, amazing spouses, Casey, and then our wonderful Director of Public Relations, Jennifer Barnhill. Also on this site, you'll find our white paper. Um, our white paper is where we basically talk about how we formed and why it's important. We, it's a fantastic PDF. This is what we send our legislators who do not know about Partners in Promise. We tell them a little bit about the military lifestyle and how it's difficult for all military families. Um, and we know that special education is, you know, a messy situation, but it's even more difficult for us um, in the military to try to address those, those issues. So whenever we do talk to our legislators, we always make sure that they know about um, the white papers so they can understand about what our mission and our vision is. And then we have the latest. The latest could be anything that we've posted to our website or our Facebook page, um, trying to give resources to them. A lot of times, for instance, we did this Blue Star um, Families webinar um, about education in the fall, and I was able to speak for a few minutes on special education. So we post that, give them updates about what's happening legislatively. And um, we've been super busy. You know, we also have been doing some work on the state level and putting military spouse um, seats on education councils, interstate compact councils. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do some of that work um, in Virginia and we're hoping to continue that um, for every state. So I wanna make sure that um, folks that are listening to this, please contact us and become a strategic partner. We are. Um, looking for more military spouses who might want to try to amplify their voices in their state for education. Um, we also are, you know, hiring a couple of folks to help us out with fundraising and a couple of other key positions. Um, so we're always um, happy to, to have some motivated, energetic <laughs> spouses to come help us out. Because <laughs> that's the thing, we're, we're not a nonprofit at this point, and it really is just four mil five military spouses at this point, really trying to um, get the word out, and it's hard. It's, it is really a full-time job. It's our passion, for sure, but we could definitely um, use some additional help. Um, so that is really the latest, and then we have resources which I wanna really spend some time on. Obviously the white paper, we talked about special education checklist and I'll go in there real quick. This is important for those who are having a hard time. Everyone's having a hard time during COVID. Um, but the key to making sure that your child gets back on track is one, figuring out what their present level performance is. And this checklist will help you. It'll help you get back on track. Um, it tells you what to document and how to get organized. So that when you do have that IEP meeting, when you go back to school, or if you have it over the summer, it tells you what you need to do. We also have this fantastic, because um, I'm an engineer, so I love it. <laughs> it has this great chart of what you can fill out and how many days they missed, how many, you know, what type of goals that they miss out on, you know, related services, because really it comes down to data. You know, data drives services. And if you're not receiving it, you have to just know. You can't just say, well, I saw my child X, Y, Z. You really need to chart what's happening um, so that when you come to the table, it is based on fact and not emotion. So that will help guide, I think, a lot of our families. Um, if they're due for compensatory services, um, that's what they're gonna need to have is something very specific. This is what I saw my child. I tried my best on these goals, but it, it, I'm not you know, the expert in this thing. So I feel that they regressed and this is the data that I have. And I think we need to bump up you know, or you know, put in some other type of recruitment service. 
Um, and then we got the EFMP education, special education binder and talks. Um, Shannon did a great video about what, I don't think it's popping up right here, um, what to put in your IEP binder if you're moving, PCSing, that's really important, but you need to have certain documents always with you. And because it's easy, easy to get too many documents. It's, it's a law, federal law. So you can imagine you got meeting notices, you got prior written notices, you got the IEP, you got draft IEPs, you got evaluations. It's exhausting, but some investment in a organization binder like what she put together is going to help these families tremendously. Um, and then uh, last, we also have um, some webinars, obviously, that we've been doing that talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. It is, it is so important to have some guidance. And there is other websites out there, Military One Source. Um, but I think these are very succinct and just to the point, you know, and I think people can go here and find out exactly what they need. Right. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that we have Grace Kim on our um, co-founder, she's, you know, special education attorney. She knows what happens at these meetings. She knows what's necessary in case it does have to get elevated to a due process or mediation. Um, mm -hmm. These are good, good things. We also have EFMP stories. If anyone would like to contact us and share their EFMP stories, we're, um, we're kind of getting a whole spectrum of folks to talk about how they became an EFMP family and what has helped them, tips and tricks and those type things. Um, we have a lot of our founders on there, but we've also added some other folks um, that are part of Partners and Promise Strategic Partners. So if anyone has an EFMP um, story that they'd love to share, we would love to hear from you. Some of these are very specific too. Grace talks about IEP meetings and what needs to happen. She talks about due process. She talks about advocacy. Um, Shannon shares about her story and how she moved from Annapolis to San Diego and where she had some significant issues there. So um, I, I think these are really great um, stories that you can uh, that your members can definitely check on to know that they're not alone and that we are hearing them and we are working hard to make sure that EFMP works for them as it was intended to. Just great, great stuff. So I'm, you know, we could, we could continue on and you could just go through your website for probably another two hours <laughs> with me. <Yeah. laughs> Which is why I'm excited to talk about the next thing that um, I wanted to bring up is that you and your uh, partners uh, have agreed to provide uh, to some of our Navy families through our core program through Naval Services Family Line, our continuum of resources and education, uh, an opportunity for people to come together to hear what you all are doing, um, to check out your resources and to ask some questions. Yay. Um, I'm so excited about this. This is so, yeah. <laughs> it really, we are so thankful for the invitation and we would love, love, love to be able to share, you know, our advocacy, but then also just, you know, do whatever we can to support these families. Um, I know that we talked about the importance of this fall when our students or some of them are going back in person, some of them are not, you know, what are their rights? You know, when, if they are in virtual, um, what to sign, but not to sign, those type things. And so I think that the timing will be perfect because I don't see the COVID-19 going away anytime no. soon. And um, this can have a real impact, you know, on our families and their most vulnerable children. So we need to just kind of keep the conversation going and try to guide them in the right directions as far as, you know, assist in any way we can um, and to personalize it as much as we can too. Absolutely. Instead of just being a checklist or a website, you know, I think a lot of people are like, just go to Military One Source, go to Go to White Sox, go whatever. It's just sometimes nice to be able to, to see people who are going through it right now and have some type of, you know, roadmap on how to try to navigate this. It's, it's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. But we appreciate it. And we're looking forward to it. It's great to partner. Um, I see some great things in the future for us. And um, with, yeah, Naval Services Family. And we've got a lot of things in mind. So um, this will be a great first step for us. I'm just thrilled because I think that that's one of those things where, you know, people have great ideas and they're just making amazing uh, in ways into whether it was that, remember the, the housing thing we were talking about, just the yeah. changes. 
and that. And then, you know, I see these changes, but then there's a lot of families out there who are like, but I'm not really sure how to implement this. I'm not really sure how this can actually affect me. And so the opportunity for you all to share your, how that can, how these laws that they're on, like you said, they're on the books. Yeah. It's not for, <laughs> for having to change the law to get this. I mean, these are things that our school districts need to do and to partner together. So I am really excited that you and I um, are able to, to kind of make this happen. And it's going to be great. And uh, we would love to share this resource, you know, on our website, our Facebook page, Partners with Promise. Um, I think some great, and you know, of course, you know, the EFMP app is coming out soon. There's just a lot of great resources that are going to be out there with the pilot program. Um, it's going to, it's, it's coming at a very good time. That's all I can yeah. say. And I'm just, Kudos to Navy leadership, you know, for recognizing these issues and wanting to try to solve it. Um, and they have done a great job reaching out to other services, you know, with Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, it, good things are happening. And so it's taken a while for everybody to get on track, but, you know, I'm great, glad that, you know, Navy and Marine Corps, boom, doing good things. And so, you know, um, and you guys are doing a fantastic job giving those resources to all of these wonderful families. Um, we're just happy to be a part of it. So again, volunteers, if anyone's super energetic and has a gift for fundraising or any other type of volunteering that they want to, if they're feeling passionate about this, we would love them to join our team. And um, we, how, do they, how do they sign up to join your team? So they just go to our website, thepromiseact.org, and there is a Get Connected um, button that they can go through and it will ask for their basic information. Um, we're also hoping you guys can help us out when we do our annual survey that's coming up this fall. We are in the process of developing it. We are working with um, University of Alabama, the University of North Carolina, William and Mary, um, and a couple of other MSOs. And so once we get a, a finalized survey, we're hoping that you all will distribute it with us and so we can get some good feedback. Um, so that's coming up very soon this fall and uh, just a lot of good things are happening you know, all at once. It's great. <laughs> I, I, yeah. am wild. I am, you know, sometimes things just happen in the right place in the right time. And so I feel like yep. what military, uh, well, Naval Services Family Line is kind of where we're, the direction we're heading and the direction you guys are heading. I feel like we're, we're at a great intersection for that. Absolutely. So, um, I do want to ask you one thing. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, actually, sometimes it can be hard to answer this question. Uh, you know, you've been a Navy spouse, as you said, for two plus decades. Yeah. Uh, Greg and I are on our third decade. Wow. Um, Congratulations. 30 years. Um, but what would you say as, you know, for that new spouse, maybe who's, you know, maybe doesn't, they don't even have children yet, but they're just right. kind of launching on this Navy adventure. Like what would you, or what would you have told yourself, you know, 20 mm -hmm. plus years ago as you, like... <laughs> Take this, put this in your pocket and pull it out whenever you are. You know, you know? I think those are great questions. And, you know, it changes over time as far as what that, that would be. But for me, it would be find your tribe, you know, from the get-go. You need to find the people that you can connect with to, to really enjoy this Navy adventure. Um, and for me, you know, when I was first young, we had no kids, you know, hanging out with the other professional spouses and and, you know, doing all the things that I would never think about doing now with children. <laughs> Finding your tribe is so important. You need to lean on it, someone you can trust, because this is not an easy career, but it is so fulfilling. And the friendships that you make, um, you know, I, we still have reunions with our first JO squadron um, many, many years ago. I love them all. And... Um, you know, I think even though you probably know lots of folks at this point that have retired and they miss the camaraderie, yes. they miss that friendship, the tightness of the friendships that you develop when, you know, you're at home with your other friends or spouses are deployed, whether it be the first time they're deployed, the eighth time, you know, you really need that support system. So find your tribe. And again, as that changes over time, for us, my, my tribe is special education people and EFMP people. You know, and so it's important to, to, to have that strong support system. And um, you're going to have to sometimes work your, out of your shell for it, too. I'm kind of one of those extroverted introvert people. So <laughs> it's hard for me sometimes, you know, to like go to a party or go to an event and I get home like, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm all peopled out, right? 
but when you first get to a new place, you're going to have to try to do that a little bit more just so that you can find your people. Um, I think that's really important, but look, you know, friendships that last many, many years and um, it's just been a real blessing for us and it has made this Navy adventure amazing. So yes, difficult times for sure, but um, it's all worth it, you know, and I'm just so, just so thankful. Navy's, Navy's been very good to us. So we're very happy. Well, I, I love that. <laughs> I think that is absolutely the truth because uh, when you find your people, it does just make the adventure that much better. You're not doing it alone. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Michelle, for joining me today. I just loved our conversation. I love hearing your story and your passion for it. And I love the difference that you're making for our Navy families. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judy, for having me. This was awesome. All right. We'll talk again soon.